I think I'm waiting for the slides to go on. Perfect. Okay, um, well, it's a pleasure to be here. It's uh, my first visit to Basel, and it's my first attendance at the CLINAM. So uh, I must thank you for the invite uh, to share some exciting work that we're doing um, with um, small activating RNA linked with dendromes. Um, I know it's a little bit of a long title, so I'm going to hopefully try and break it down into sections. Um, so I'm going to introduce you you very briefly to what SARNAs are, if you're not familiar with it. I know we're all very familiar with SIRNA. They're very similar, but they work in, in, in um, unique ways. After that, I'm going to give you a brief historical tour um, about SARNAs in our hands, and I think that's important because when we discovered SARNA, we didn't appreciate how powerful it would be as a biological tool for us. So I'm just going to very quickly go through the work that we did back then. Um, and then um, the main crux of this presentation is about SARNA in liver failure, in liver diseases. And then, of course, I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go on to talk about um, how the genius of uh, Don and his chemistry and his dendromas helped us move forward towards in vivo models. So um, this is a very archaic now schematic of what RNAs do, non-coding RNAs in cells. Of course, from college, we learned that non-coding RNAs were heavily involved in protein production from messenger RNA to ribosomal RNA and transfer RNA, etc. Um, of course, this is very relevant to us today, but it's a very simplistic view of what, what non-coding RNAs do. And we know that this is a very simplistic um, uh, effect of non-coding RNAs because now that we are beginning to unravel the human genome and we're beginning to understand that the 80% of the untranslated area of the human genome that we previously thought was junk DNA, actually isn't junk DNA because these areas contain valuable signals, valuable sequences that express non-coding RNA. And these non-coding RNAs are very complicated. There are thousands of them. There are so many of them that we've even got a subclassification system for them. And when you look at the landscape of non-coding RNA, you recognize how important they are for cell biology. You've got, um, you've got mRNAs, of course, we've got long non-coding RNAs, we've got P reinteracting RNAs, and all of these non-coding RNAs are involved in things like translation to protein signaling pathways, to stability of mRNA, to even regulating epigenetic controls of the cells. So it wasn't inconceivable to recognize that there would exist non-coding RNA that would actually be involved in specific activation of genes. And this is exactly what SARNAs are. They are small 21 nucleotide duplexes, RNA duplexes, that exists within the UTR of either promoter or enhancer regions of any genes. And what we've been able to do over the past six, seven years is re we've refined um, the algorithm, and this is all bioinformatics based, We've now refined a method of recognizing when we look at the, uh, all the noise in front of genes, we've recognized which of these areas would contain potential SARNA um, sequences. And over the six, seven years, we've been able to unravel the mechanism of action. And um, that's allowed us to draw this little cartoon here. And I'm sure that this, again, will, is very simplistic. And I'm sure it will evolve as we learn how these SARNAs work. But what I can say right now is that um, we know the argonaut proteins are involved in processing the SARNA duplexes, um, in particular argo2. So argo2 um, separates the guide strand from the duplex and carries it into the nucleus, where the guide strand recognizes its consensus sequence uh, and it recruits all the transcriptional complexes to activate that particular gene. So SARNA is a very on-target gene activation technology. So this was, all, this was all great when we realized that, but w what we didn't recognize was how important it would be um, in the biology that we were doing. So back then, um, we were working on iPSCs. I mean, it was sexy science back then to try and get um, stem cells to become anything that you, you could possibly want them to be. And uh, around about that time, type 1 diabetes um, uh, was, uh, was at the helm of research, and it still is. 
Uh, what we wanted to do was to try and get blood cells, blood stem cells, to express insulin uh, so that we could create them into an insulin surrogate cell type that would secrete um, insulin. And in order to do that, we went back to basics. We looked at all the transcription factors that were necessary during embryonic development of the pancreas. And as you could see, we came across so many different factors. And in fact, we designed SARNAs to target each and every one of these factors. It was a tedious process. But what we learned was that one particular factor was key, and that was MAFA, a transcription factor. And what was even more impressive is when we got blood, blood stem cells, CD34 positive hematopoietic stem cells, we transfected them with these SARNAs. Within nine days, these stem cells started expressing insulin. And in the presence of glucose, we had some processing of the C-peptide. When you looked at the cells themselves, something interesting was happening. So if you compare it to untransfected cells, the cells that were expressing insulin were clumping, like you would expect for beta islet cells. And they had also started forming these curious granules. And of course, when we quantified that and we exposed these cells to increasing amounts of glucose, lo and behold, we got very nice insulin um, dose-dependent increase. So, uh, dose-dependent release, excuse me. So, this was a really exciting concept for us back then. Um, we were able to write a very exciting um, story about it. But translational medicine is really all about delivery. And unfortunately, back then, we didn't have anything that would target these oligonucleotides to the pancreas. So we didn't shelve the project, but we put it aside whilst we were thinking how we were going to go about targeting the pancreas. And in the meantime, um, working in a liver-centric group where um, Professor Habib is a liver surgeon, and uh, of course, he sees liver cancer every day, it made sense for us to go back to the liver. So what is the problem with a, a degenerative liver or liver failure? Well, the primary concern is that the liver uh, or liver disease, um, hepatocytes lose their synthetic capability, so they lose the ability to um, express and secrete albumin. And without albumin, <coughs> patients become severely ill. And of course, the progression of loss of albumin cirrhosis leads to HCC, liver cancer. So the logical question then, now that we had this tool, was how do we get liver cells to express albumin? So again, we go back to basics, we go back to um, uh, development. So when we look at all the factors that are upregulated during embryonic development of the liver, um, we come up with many different genes, of course, and very tediously we, we synthesize SARNAs to each of these factors. And that's where we came across HNF4-alpha, another transcription factor. We knew it was important because it was, up, it, it was expressed in embryonic development. It was maintained during uh, the function of normal adult liver. And in liver diseases, um, HNF4 was severely suppressed. And in fact, when you look at downregulation of HNF4, you see that it's involved in many other diseases. So we knew immediately that we had something quite interesting to work with. So we thought, well, OK, what's going to happen to liver cells? So we synthesized these SARNAs. We transfected them um, using lipofectamin. And again, we were very pleased to see that we were able to get liver cells to suddenly increase albumin quite significantly. Uh, of course, we had target engagement. We, expressed, uh, we incre increased the expression of our transcription factor. And also, we were able to show increase in the cytochrome P450 enzymes. And these enzymes, as we know, are very important for the detoxification properties of the liver. So it's great to have beautiful biology in cell lines grown in culture. But as a translational group, it was all about in vivo veritas. We needed to confirm that the same observations would be seen in mice. Uh, and, and again, like I mentioned earlier on, this is, Don, this is where Don came to the rescue with his, with his dendroma complexes. Uh, of course, we knew that there were various ways of delivering oligonucleotides into animals. Um, but what attracted us to Don's dendroma were the chemical properties of it. Um, and I refer to the PAMAM dendromas. Now, I'm a biologist, I'm not a chemist, so I won't be able to give you much information about the chemistry. Suffice to say that for us, we were attracted to the fact that these dendromas would wrap themselves around our oligonucleotides. And so therefore, that meant it would protect endosomal degradation of these oligonucleotides in circulation. 
The second attractive feature, uh, which is what I mentioned earlier on, is that dendromas have high tropism to the liver. In fact, 95% of the dendromas that we label, we see go into the liver. And the other attractive feature was because of its property, once it goes into the cytoplasm of the cells, it releases its cargo into the endosomal complex. And this is exactly what we needed to deliver these oligonucleotides into the cells in vivo. So we quickly run with that. We, um, we synthesized large, large amounts of saRNA. We linked it with, uh, with Don's dendromas. And here we did a very quick pilot study in normal mice where we wanted to see how long we would be able to measure um, viability of these oligonucleotides in circulation. And what we found was that we were still able to see it by about 72 hours. And that was fine for us, because when we looked at target engagement, when we, trans when we injected these oligonucleotide dendroma complexes via tail vein injection, we were able to see target engagement, HNF4, and we were able to see albumin increase. And we saw this increase for at least two weeks before it went back down to, to normal levels. So we thought, fantastic we are able to see a biological co effect of injecting our oligonucleotides into these animals. So, of course, we had to show how this would work in pathology. And one of the major, um, one of the most important liver pathology that we, we, would, we, we want to address, of course, is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, because um, this will affect, this is very relevant to us. Relevant as well because at the moment there are no single agent that actually reverses the process of fatty liver disease. Um, and it was also very easy to establish a model of fatty liver disease because all we had to do was get rats and feed them a um, high-fat diet, which is synonymous to a Western diet of chips, burgers, etc. Um, so we fed these animals for 16 weeks, and um, at in the last two weeks we injected the dendromas. These are... These are our little uh, um, candidates. And as you would expect, when these animals were fed um, a high-fat diet, this is the liver. And when you look at the liver architecture, you see a lot of white dots there. And these white dots are fat globules. So you could see s there was significant accumulation of fat globules in the liver. And when we treated these animals with dendrona, and this is just two weeks of treatment, immediately you could see reversal um, of these fat droplets where the liver looked pretty much back to what normal uh, uh, what a li normal liver should look like um, of course we extracted the uh, the liver from these animals and because we wanted to see whether or not we had target engagement whether or whether or not the liver was expressing HNF4 alpha and it did we got significant increase in HNF4 alpha from the liver lobes when we looked at certain blood parameters uh, firstly, we wanted to make sure that these animals didn't, um, were not inducing a, a, an immune response or were not stressed uh, or didn't um, uh, have any uh, un unwanted effects. So white blood cells were normal, um, IL-6 cytokines normal again. Um, when we looked at liver cholesterol, it was great. We found significant decrease in liver cholesterol. When we looked at HDL-LDL ratio, the good cholesterol, we found significant increase um, from these animals. And what was also interesting was that we found um, uh, evidence that proponents of inflammation and cirrhosis were also decreasing in the liver of these animals. So put together, when we look at a global overview of uh, all the other factors that were being affected from the liver, what we had, uh, and this, is, this represents a proteomic profile of the liver lobes um, from the treated animals, what what we found were a lot of proteins were repressed, suppressed, a lot of proteins were upregulated. And then when you, do w when you do functional analysis of these proteins, it was, it was quite nice for us to see that most of the proteins that, are, that were affected, proteins that were upregulated and downregulated, were all involved in lipid metabolism. And, and this is exactly what we wanted. And um, when we looked at the genetics, or when we looked at the gene profile of these genes, the majority of them had HNF4 binding sites. So we knew that we had a transcription factor that were engaging many uh, liver genes that would uh, reset the transcriptional network of the liver in order to allow it to go back to its normal function. 
So, um, and this is just a summary of what we saw. We saw um, increase in lipid transport in the liver, increased fatty oxidation, etc. So, this is where we're at now. Um, the future of dendroma SARNA studies is quite promising because whilst we are now improving the formulation of our SARNA oligos, we're, we're improving the bioinformatics of it so that we're able to find SARNAs that have stronger activity. Um, the world of dendroma is, is obviously going forward and I'm sure that there'll be better, more refined dendromas that we can move on to pre better preclinical studies and hopefully human studies. Because then that leaves the door open, because the liver is a wonderful organ, uh, and we know that the liver does many things, including glucose metabolism. So if I then very quickly go back to the first gene that we um, ever worked with, uh, the SARNA to MAFA, when we injected this into diabetic rats, we immediately saw that the liver was able to clear circulating glucose. So this is very preliminary, we're still working on this, but it was quite exciting to see how we can uh, exploit the liver with the use of dendromas to address certain metabolic diseases. So I'm going to end here. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, London is still part of the EU. Uh, we want to foster more collaboration. And at the moment, we have a lot of people who are working with us. And if any of you guys have SARNAs that you need for your favorite gene, then we are more than happy to help. So I'll end here. Thank you.